All right, this is part two of the chapter four video. Um, so um, continuing on discussion of the problems, I am now going to discuss the, or at least do a problem that relates now the normal force, all right? So I'm gonna do a cut node Johnson 4.38, talks about that. All right, so we left the gravitational force for a moment, and we're going to go to the normal force. So what we have here is a 35-kilogram crate. 35-kilogram crate. Rest on a horizontal floor. And a 65 kilogram person standing on the crate. Determine the magnitude of the normal force. That A. The floor exerts on the crate. And B. The crate exerts on the person. All right, so again, as, as we read this, a 35 kilogram crate rests on a horizontal floor and a 65 kilogram person is standing on the crate. Determine the magnitude of the normal force that A, the floor exerts on the crate and B, the crate exerts on the person. Okay, let's write this as a picture. All right, so you got that. Again, Cutnell Johnson, 4.38. We've been working in primarily in your textbook today. All righty. So what's this picture look like? Oh, well, you have a floor. Let me just draw it over here. You have a floor. Typically, I'll put little, eh, doesn't look good. I'll put little hash marks on to kind of indicate that it's a floor. We have a crate, and we have a person standing on that crate, all right? So there's going to be a normal force, maybe we'll call it N1. This crate has a mass, all right? Call it the M1 for the mass of the crate, and we'll say M2 is the mass of the person. Now, there will be a normal force from the floor onto the crate. Call it N1. We'll say there's a normal force, so let's draw it this way, that the crate exerts on the person. We'll call that N2. All right, and so what's, what's happening here? Well, so again, M1 is the mass of the crate, 35 kilograms. So again, you know, all that, all the words, let's see what they mean. Mass of crate. M2, mass of person. N1, we don't know what that is, but that's gonna be the normal force that the floor exerts in the crate. 
normal meaning perpendicular to a surface. Again, in words, N2 in my nomenclature is the normal force that the crate exerts on the person. So we have two different problems that we need to do here. So we have to, first of all, we, to, we want to find the, the, the crate the normal force exerts on the uh, the floor exerts in the crate. So what's happening here? Well, again, we're going to apply Newton's second law. There's nothing really going on in the y direction. So the only real equation we really have is in what we, I'm sorry, there's nothing going on in the x direction. Really, the only equation we have is along the vertical y, right? Some of our forces in the y direction. What are our forces? Well, if we assume that positive y is up in our orientation, then the normal is going to point up. That's going to be positive. So we'll say N1 is up. What are all the forces that is, that's going to be on the floor? Well, it's going to be the combined weight of the crate and the person. So you have the, the weight of the crate minus M1G. And that's down. Weight's always down. And the weight of the person, M2G. Again, that's all the forces, the combined weight of the crate and the weight of the person, that, those are both going to be in the negative direction. The normal force is up. And again, um, normally you'd say, well, that's going to be equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. But there is no acceleration. You don't, you don't see there being acceleration. So that acceleration is actually zero. So the right-hand side of this equation is zero. That means you can just basically throw these other terms over. And you get that N1 is M1G plus M2G. Again, the right-hand side of this equation is now zero. And I can combine this to say, well, N1 is just M1 plus M2 all multiplied by G, factoring G out. Or we have the weight of the crate, 35 kilograms. The weight of the person, 65 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared. Again, we're back on Earth. We find out that the normal force, N1, in this problem is going to be 980 newtons. That is the normal force that the floor pushes up on the crate plus person system. 980 newtons. Okay, now we want to ask, so I can just erase all this. Is the, this, is the, this, is, this, is, um, this is question part A. All right, and there's, part A does not depend on, part B does not depend on part A, so I can just erase all of A. <clears throat> and we'll just kind of do it again. And this time we want to find out what the normal force, again, normal forces are surface forces. It's a force that the surface applies to an object that's, that's causing a force for whatever reason or another, for in this case, because of weight. So this is the force that the floor exerts. That's a surface force. And what's being pushed against it, that's being pushed against it is the, is the weight of the crate and the weight of the person. Now we want to talk about the normal force at the top surface of the crate. And so the weight of the crate does not matter now. Now the only thing pushing against that top surface is just the weight of the person. All right, so for part B... If we want the normal force, that upper surface force, the only force that it's going to experience is the weight of the person. So again, it's it's going to be second summation of all forces in the y direction is the normal N2. And again, that's pointed up. And the only force going against it is M2G. And again, there's no acceleration. And that I would expect. I do not expect the, I do not expect, acceleration means that the, that there's movement. There's no movement in the y direction. This is a stationary problem. It's an equilibrium problem. So it's going to be zero on the right hand side, as I said again, just like last time. Real easy to solve this. N2 is just M2G 
or 35 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared. We find out that the normal force of the upper surface is nothing more than um, 637 newtons. There you are. <clears throat> Again, the normal force is a surface force. It's a force that the surface pushes back on an object applying a force to it. Okay. Um, now, we have another force in physics um, that we like that we like to uh, that we oftentimes will study, and that's called tension. All right. So again, this is the normal force. We also have what's called the tension force. We're just kind of going through various type, types of forces that you may experience. So tension force would be like if you tie a rope to something. Now, what's nice about the tension force is you can actually direct the force exactly as you wish. So, for instance, if I if I tie a rope to some object and I decided I have an object, you know, M, and I know it has a weight mg, and I say, well, I really want to tie it in such a way where I'm going to have, you know, a rope going this way and say a rope going that way to say some sort of a ceiling. Well, what's nice about tension is, let's say I have a of a tension T1 going in one direction and tension T2. Well, the entire force is along that string. If I want, I can actually very nicely direct the force very, you know, exactly as I wish it to be. And all that force will be along that rope or that cable. So that's the beauty about, about tension is that you can actually direct the force as you like. You have complete control over the force. However you want to, you know, so these tensions would have certain angles, let's so say theta 2 and say theta 1. And in a sense, these are tension, tension forces. You can direct the forces however you wish. That's the nice thing about tension. You have complete control over the forces. So let's do a, a problem like that. So let's do a tension problem. Again, tension is another kind of a force. It has units of newtons. Let's go to let's do an open stacks problem now. Open stacks. <clears throat> 4.19. Okay. Open stacks 4.19 says calculate the tension. And this is a uh, part A. Sorry. OpenStax 4.19, so we'll go to the other, the old physics books that is not official for this class, but I like to use it. Calculate the tension. Um, of a vertical strand of spider web. If a spider of mass uh, eight point zero zero then ten negative five kilograms hangs motionless on it. And then B, calculate the tension in a horizontal string. if the spider sits motionless in the middle of it. Uh, 
All right, so, and um, I'll draw a picture here. The strand sags at an angle of 12 degrees below the horizontal. All right, here we go. So, uh, part A. So, open stacks 4.19. Calcu a, calculate the tension of a vertical strand of spider web. If a spider of mass 8.00 then 75 kilograms hangs motionless on it. B, calculate the tension in a horizontal strand, of, uh, strand if the spider sits motionless in the middle of it. Uh, the strand sags at an angle of 12 degrees below the horizontal. Again, I'll draw a picture to make this look better. So, so again, we have a spider. You know, first of all, simple problem. We have a spider hanging motionless on a vertical strand of web. So, uh, let me or, or, or strand of silk. So, let me um, erase this now. Again, we're back in open stacks now. And as a research physicist, you. Research scientists you need to know you want to reference various books, various tomes, if you will. So part A is we have our spider. This little bot, dot right here, and we'll say that spider has a mass M. And what are the forces on the spider? Again, it's a free, free body diagram. Well, the only forces acting on the spider is its weight. Going straight down toward the ground. Again, we'll kind of assume a positive Y going up. And the only other force is the tension force in the web. Call it T. Those are the only two forces acting on the spider. All right, and so what do we do? We apply Newton's second law. Newton's second law says the for sum of all forces in the Y direction. Well, let's see. What is that? It's... Uh, <clears throat> Up is positive, so tension up, tension, T for tension. I know I used it in the past for thrust, but this time it's tension. And minus mg, the weight. That's the weight, because you have a mass, you have a weight. And normally that would be m times a sub y. However, the spider sits motionless, so a sub y is zero. Spider is motionless means that there is no acceleration so given that's zero it's real easy to figure this out the tension is then mg and so tension is the mass of the spider i was given that as 8.00 times 10 negative 5 kilograms and a gravitational acceleration is 9.80 meters per second squared. The tension in the web, in the web strand, which happens to be the equal to equal and opposite of the weight of the spider in this particular case, vertical case, is you work it out, you get that it's going to be, um, uh, did I work it out? Let's see. Yes. Uh, 7.8 times 10 negative 4 newtons. That is the tension that the strand feels if it is if it's just a vertical strand of, of silk and the spider is hanging on it, motionless. But part B means says that you're going to now, okay, so let's kind of remember this uh, 7.8. Well, I'm gonna use it in a few, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a little bit lazy here. So again, T is 7.8 T. I'll, I'll show you why in a moment. I'm just gonna reuse this in part B. So T, remember, is mg. We found out that at 7.8 times 10 negative 4 newton. I'm just going to reuse this for laziness purposes. All right, so um, now I'm going to go and look at another problem. That's part A's answer. Now my part B says, okay, now you have a situation where you're so, you know, whatever reason, your, you know, your 
horizontal would be between these two points. However, the spider sits in the middle, and I'm gonna try to draw this best I can. The spider sits now in the middle of, of these two endpoints, and there's gonna be a sag. Okay, so there's gonna be a sag in the thread. So this really this really supposed to be one continuous thread. Spider sitting on it, and sag, causing it to sag. So the sag is going to be at an angle theta on each side. Theta, we are told, this is part B, theta, we are told, is 12 degrees. Okay? And so what's happening here now is that the spider is still going to have mg pointing straight down. Still, it's still going to experience a force straight down. But now... And that's its weight. But now there's going to be tension that's going to be in the strands. And hypothetically, we would say there's two separate tensions. We would say that we have a T1 and a T2. However, I'm going to use a symmetry argument. I'm going to say by symmetry, uh, there is no reason... to believe that T1 is different in magnitude than T2. So I'm going to make an assumption that T1 equals T2 equals T. They're in the same tension. Spider's right in the middle. So what I'm going to now say is that, well, I yeah, normally I'd call these different tensions, but now I'm going to make a symmetry argument and say that those tensions are the same magnitude. And I really can't do the problem unless I make that decision because I'll have too many unknowns. Okay? So I'm making that, making that assumption. <clears throat> and so let's uh, <coughs> let's uh, apply Newton's second law now. So let's see here. I'm going to apply summation of all forces in the x direction. I'm just going to apply it blindly. All right, summation of all forces in the x direction. What are the x direction forces? Let's see. I have ten, the, the right tension, and it's going to have what? It's going this direction. It's going to have a positive x and a positive y. It's a first quadrant tension. So I'm talking about x directions here, so it's going to be a positive. And let's see here. The adjacent is the cosine. So I would say, oh, okay, positive t cosine of theta. All right. How about the left tension? Well, it's a, it's a second quadrant vector. It's going to be negative x and a positive y. Second quadrant vector, negative x. And what is it again? Oh, adjacent cosine. Minus T cosine theta. The gravity, the weight, is entirely in the y direction. It does not it does not participate in the in the x component equation? And given that the spider is motionless, there is no acceleration. So again, no acceleration. That's why I can write zero on the right hand side. What do I get? I get zero equals zero. Okay. Doesn't tell me anything. Well, sometimes that happens. Sometimes you write an equation down and it doesn't tell you anything. That's okay. So this X equation doesn't tell me anything. I mean, I kind of knew that already. I just did this for you guys. Just to let you know that once in a while you, you say, okay, well, that's a blind alley. Okay. But it's okay. I mean, zero equals zero. Sure. That's a statement of truth. So that doesn't, so the X direction equation doesn't tell you anything. That's okay. So, what we hope is that the y direction will tell us something. All right, and so y direction is going to be that the sum of all forces in the y direction. Okay, so what did I say before? The the right tension it's a first quadrant vector, so positive x, positive y, positive y, right? That's going to be a positive t. Let's see, it's the opposite, right? So t sine of theta from the right tension. The left tension, second quadrant vector, negative x, positive y. 
That's another positive T sine of theta. And this time, the entire weight acts in the y direction, and that acts negatively. So minus mg, and again, because the spider is motionless, I normally have mass times acceleration in the y direction, but there is, again, the spider is motionless. There is no acceleration. Because there's no acceleration, I write zero. It's for the same reason I did before. <clears throat> well, let's see, a simple algebra here. 2t, I got 2t sine theta minus mg equals zero. And I'll put the mg on the other side. I have 2t sine theta is mg. And I'll divide both sides by 2 and by the sine of theta. I get that t is mg divided by 2 sine of theta. I'm going to be lazy, like I said before. I remember I remembered what mg was. So I'm just going to write it again. I have 7.8. I calculated that before in part A. Times 10, negative 4 newtons. Divided by 2 sine of 12 degrees. I will find in this problem, when I calculate this, that I, I, I calculate this, I get that it is going to be 1.88. times 10 to the negative 3 newtons. All right, so that is, this is, this is T from part A, this is T from part B. Now, well, let's not be confusing here. This is from part A, this is from part B. There you go. So, <clears throat> And there's one other part of the problem that wants you to calculate the ratio. So um, we want to find, we want to compare the tension. Uh, we want to find the ratio. So uh, we want to find the ratio of the, of the answers. And so I, I'm a, I mean, I could just easily calculate that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do it in a clever way. <clears throat> so typically, you know, you, one way you can do is you want to find a ratio. So one last, I'm going to find a ratio of the part B answer over the part A answer. What was the part B answer? The part B answer was, the part B answer was mg divided by the sine of theta. Remember that? We just calcul calculated that. The part A answer was mg. Well, if I multiply 1 over mg, 1 over mg, I find out that this answer the ratio is nothing more than one divided. Oops, I'm sorry. This is a two sine of theta. The, I find out that the ratio is nothing more than one one divided by two sine of theta. So I find out that the ratio of the answers is one divided by two sine of twelve degrees. And I find out that's actually equal to two point four. I mean, I could have just divided this number by this number and got the same answer, right? But again, it's kind of a more slick, clever way of doing these ratios. You can kind of get it as just the one divided by two sine of the angle. All right, that's your tension. Let me, uh, <clears throat> okay, so I want to discuss something else now. Okay, now we discuss tension. I'm going to do, um, okay, so everything we've discussed so far among, uh, in, the, in, the, in the topic of forces has been theoretical forces, all right? And so all these forces can be predicted theoretically, and we will verify them through experiment. So all forces... that we have discussed so far are theoretical forces. I.e. forces that are predicted By theory, 
and verified by experiment. And what forces are we talking about? Well, gravitational force. Normal force. Tension. These are all forces that we have discussed. And, you know, in there, in this, this is Newton's third law. Tension is an easy application of Newton's second law. Gravitational force is a law of universal gravitation. All these forces that you know we have we have been able to discuss are all theoretical forces. We're going to predict them through the theory. However, we'll find out that there are some forces that you can't do that. Some of, some forces are are experimental. We do not understand them theoretically. All right. And so one example. So some forces cannot be understood theoretically only experimentally I'm going to discuss one of those forces right now and it is the force of friction force of friction is what we're going to talk about now Friction is an empirically, an entirely empirical force. All right, so let's talk about friction. All right, we've got everything that we're, we've been able to predict beautifully in theoretical physics. Now we have to, we don't understand, we know friction is there, but we do not understand it. And so we have to give an empirical evaluation of it. And so, how does friction work? Um, let me. Uh, Give you an example here. Uh, I'll be right back. Let me get a, let me get a coin. Going to do a little experiment. Okay, and so I just have a simple nickel, you know, American coin, a nickel, and I have a a uh, clipboard with paper on it. So here's my clipboard, and here is a nickel. Putting on the clipboard. Now the clipboard is basically perpendicular. I'm sorry, it's it's parallel to the ground. And what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start tilting the clipboard ever so slightly. As I tilt the clipboard, at some angle, the coin begins to move. But before you reach that angle, there's no reason. Like right here, to, there's no reason for the coin to move at all. So, but at some point, actually, let me, let me do something better. This, this uh, clipboard seems to, you know what, let me do the clipboard itself. This paper is very slick. All right, let me do the actual clipboard itself. So. Or maybe the clipboard is slick too. Yeah. Um, all right, let me try something that's not as slick. Sorry about that. I thought I would have a little more, a little more resistance. Um, all right, I have myself a little box, cardboard box, and I have the nickel on that. I apologize. So again, I'm going to pull. I'm going to have the cardboard box right here. And as I tilt the box, the nickel doesn't slide. Nickel doesn't slide. And eventually I get to a point. What's happening here? Well, I'm, I have a, a, I have no gravitational force in the, you know, in the direction of the plane. But as I, as I tilt the plane, I'm increasing the gravitational force along the plane. And eventually it gets to a point where, so right now there's, there's force going down the plane as I, as I tilt this thing. Eventually, eventually, I reach a certain angle, the nickel starts to slide. So what, what's really going on is that, is that as I, again, it's not such a great example, I guess, but as I increase the, the force, um, so what am I doing here? So we're talking about friction. 
let's kind of start off uh, simple here. So I have an object sitting on a floor or a surface, okay? Sitting on a surface, and there's going to be, you know, this surface is made out of, let's say, material one, and say the object is made out of material two. I don't know, it could be glass on wood or, or wood on steel or whatever it happens to be, and these two objects rub against each other, all right? So there's an, let's say there's a, this has a mass M. Now, I'm going to apply a force. And as I apply the force, the force, first of all, the object is not moving. So I'm going to try to, let me try to maybe apply the, imagine pushing over here. Let me try to make this look a little bit better. I'm going to push. I'm going to push with a force. So I'm going to try to push. And what's happening is the object does not move. What's happening is that a surface force called the frictional force, little f, is opposing capital F. So capital F is application force. That could be just my hand, or it could be me tilting the book. I mean, I'll talk about the, I'll talk about the uh, a tilted plane in a moment. Application force. I'm just applying a force, maybe pushing it. And it's being opposed by friction. We'll call this the force of static friction. Static means stationary. I find that the force that in that while the object is stationary. The force of static friction is equal to an opposite the application force. Okay, so there you have it. So the more I push, the more I'm the more application the more frictional force is opposing it. So if I, you know, if I push twice as hard, the frictional force is twice as hard. At some point, however, I reach a breaking point. Okay, so again, the more I push with the application force, I'm always going to be met with the application force minus the frictional force equals zero. So if I apply more application force, I'm met with more, more opposing frictional force. And they two balance each other out. Okay, now, so I'll, I'll write that down. So again, the greater the application force, <clears throat> capital F, the greater the uh, equalizing force of static friction. Little f, all right? So again, nothing happens. It doesn't move. The two forces balance each other. But at some point, I reach a breaking point. So, for some application 
force cap F. Capital F, I said cap F means capital F. Um, we reach a breaking point. where the object just begins to slide. This is the maximum force of static friction. And I'll denote that by F sub S max. S means static, max means maximum. So I finally reach a maximum force where I just start sliding, just barely start sliding. All right, and so we actually can characterize that through an empirical formula, what that maximum force of static friction is. Okay, so the maximum force of static friction, maximum force, of static friction F sub S max is empirically equal to some coefficient mu sub S times the normal force. Now, again, mu, I believe the capital M in Greek is just the little m here. That's the uh, capital M in Greek, I believe it's capital M, and mu looks like a funny looking uh, uh, U, but has a little tail on it, that's called mu, is little m in Greek. And this is kind of like the sound of a cat, mu, mu. So, so essentially, little mu. So we have mu sub s. Again, we have to keep borrowing Greek letters. We're only in chapter four, all right? So mu is the coefficient of static friction. So hang on one second while I grab my textbook. So if we want to if we want to find, we have to look up these values. So I'm grabbing my Cotton Old Johnson textbook here, and I'm going to go to chapter four. And uh, let's see here. And we'll talk about, see where they talk about friction. Okay, I'm looking at table 4.2 in Cottonell and Johnson. And in your book, at least in my book, that's page 97. If you look at table 4.2, you have different scenarios. The materials that are involved, for instance, glass, uh, let's see, ice, uh, let's see. Rubber on dry concrete. Let's kind of take a look. Let's go, you know, down a little bit. I'm going to the third one. Yeah. 
glass on glass, ice on ice at zero degrees Celsius, rubber on dry concrete. You know, for instance, if you read that, you find out that as an example, um, let's say I have rubber. This is made out of rubber. And let's just say this is dry concrete as my materials. I would look up in the book and I'd find out that my mu sub s, again, that's my first column. I'll see, find, I'll see two. I'll call it, there's a coefficient of static friction. I'm going to talk about that right now and I'll talk about the next one, coefficient of kinetic friction in a minute. If I look it up and I get 0 0.7. Again, okay, this is a unitless number. It's unitless. Why? Because here's a force and here's a force. And so this has to be unitless. I mean, the, you set them multiply together, multiply together to get a force. It is an empirical value that indicates how slippery something is. The smaller mu sub s is, the easier something is to slip away. The larger it is means that it, you know, it's going to stick. It's going to be harder for you to actually finally get it to slide. So, and again, I get, you know, so it could, it, this could be made out of rubber, this could be made out of concrete, or this block could be made out of concrete, and the, and the floor could be made out of rubber. It doesn't matter. It's just one particular material is rubbing against the other. And if that's the case, the coefficient of static friction between the two is, would be 0 0.7. I can, I can go further down. I can say rubber on wet concrete. Okay, that's, uh, well, I'm sorry. Rubber on dry concrete, I'm sorry, this is this is actually 1.0. If this was wet concrete, it's 0 0.7. If I go and say steel on ice, I get 0 0.1, extremely slippery. If I say steel on steel, I get 0 0.78. Teflon on Teflon, real slippery, 0 0.04. Wood on wood, 0 0.35. So again, I look at my table, and depending upon what materials are actually involved, I look up a value. So that tells me, you know, if you ask me why I know it's empirical, well, it's empirical because I have to actually look something up. It's empiric It's dependent upon an experiment. If that's the case, that's empirical. That means it's experimental. All right. So in this case, you know, given I know, so, so given that I know that the normal force is Again, the sum of all forces in the y direction, in this case, is going to be what? Normal force will be up, and mg is down, and I don't see an acceleration. There will be no acceleration in the y direction. So the normal force, in this case, is just mg. And so, in this particular case, my maximum force static friction will be mu sub s times mg. All right. Now, this is a case where the object was at first stationary, and I had to get it to break away. Once it's broken away, it's in a new regime called a kinetic regime. All right. So this is the static regime. This is static friction. So I could be more exact in what I was talking about. This actually is static friction. Again, a regime where the object is at rest and you start to apply a force to try to get it to move and you're being met with resistance. That the, that the, for, that the force of friction is equal and opposite of your application force. Eventually, you find the maximum force of application where that force is equal to the force of static friction, the maximum force of static friction, and we happen to know that what that is, we can empirically determine that as the as a coefficient that you determine experimentally by doing an experiment. I mean, again, if we were meeting face to face, we'd actually do this very experiment, but we're not going to. The, you know, so you you would uh, do an experiment to find the coefficient of static friction, you multiply it by the normal force, and you get an expression for that experimentally predicted maximum force of static friction given at between two different materials again whatever the material the the nature of the materials is very important in determining what that force is actually going to be 
you know, certain materials rubbing on certain materials, that force, that force is going to be smaller. And, and in other cases, other situations, it'll be larger. It all depends on the nature of the material. And why is that? Well, it's because if you look in a microscopic sense, let's just take a look at these might seem smooth, but microscopically, if I look at it, what I'm actually going to see are like little feet. So it's little feet on one surface connect, you know, basically rubbing up against little feet on another surface. And the two are, you know, you have one, you're, you know, trying to move against the other. The two are going to catch on each other until finally they break away. So it's a very complicated, um, it would be very extremely complicated to try to predict this theoretically. All right. So we, all we can do is experimentally. Because that's in, the, that's in the static regime. That's how things work with static friction. We'll do some problems to, 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 you know, to understand this better. Don't worry. Now, in the kinetic friction regime, okay, we have another regime, kinetic friction. Kinetic is a word that means motion. Okay? Kinetic friction means now the block is sliding. So now the block is sliding. So block is now sliding. It's in motion. So now the frictional force will always be little f equals mu sub k times the normal. That's a different value. Again, you go to the table and you have the coefficient of kinetic friction. That's called mu sub k. All right? And so I'll, I'll do some problems here. Don't worry. So again, let's remember what these mean. These are empirical. You, look, you do an experiment and calculate what these are. Again, mu sub s is the coefficient of static friction. It depends on what materials are involved. Different, different materials rubbing on each other will give you a different answer. The mu sub k, again, S means static. Mu sub k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. These are unitless. There are no units. You don't put newtons or anything in there. There are no units. It is just a number. It is a coefficient. It's just a number. It is a unitless number. Okay? Let me uh, work a couple of problems to try to get this point across. All right? So I want to work um, problem Cutnell Johnson 4.39. Going back to Cutnell Johnson. Friction. All right, so we're going to do the problems of friction. So <clears throat> I have a 60 kilogram crate. Okay, uh, rests on a level floor. of a shipping dock. All right, um, the coefficients of static and kinetic friction. are 0 0.760 and no, no units and 0 0.410.
respectively. Okay, um, what horizontal pushing force is required? To A, <clears throat> just start the crate moving. And B, slide the crate across the dock. At a constant speed. All right. A lot of writing here. All right. So here we go. Um, 60 kilogram crate rests on a level floor of a shipping dock. The coefficients of static and kinetic friction are 0 0.760 and 0 0.410, respectively. What horizontal pushing force is required to A, just start the crate moving? and B, slide the crate across the dock at a constant velocity. Okay, so let's, um, let's discuss, you know, what this means uh, as far as a picture and mathematics. So again, uh, write that down. Hopefully you got it all. You got the pause button. I'm going to erase this now. Okay, um, so here we go. We have, what's our situation? I read on the side here. I have a box or a crate. It's on a level floor of a shipping dock. Okay, let's put those little hash marks for that. Um, the crate has a certain mass, M. Now, what are the forces on this? Well, we know that there is a weight that the crate is going to experience straight down mg. We also know that the floor is going to push on, push up on the crate with a normal force n. We also know there's a horizontal pushing force f. These are the forces that are on this crate. And of course, we have a frictional force going the other way, little f. Those are the forces on this crate. And so let's write down. So again, for part A, the crate's not moving. The crate is stationary. Which means you are, you are in the static regime. And so let's see, what's the mass? The mass of the crate. We're told the mass is uh, 60 kilograms. And we're also told, well, let's see, what do we want to use? Well, we're going we're gonna to want to use the coefficient of static friction in this particular case. Why? Because, uh, because the crate is not moving. We're pushing it, pushing it to certain value, certain maximum, for certain, certain application forces equal and opposite to the maximum force of static friction. So it just begins to move. All right, so we're just breaking it away. So we're told that that coefficient is 0 0.760. Again, you can only know that through experiments. It's not a theoretically predicted force. All right, so then what? Um, so we want to we want to basically just get the crate to move. So we have the sum of all forces and the x direction. We're going to apply Newton's second law. Sum of force and x direction. What what force would that be? Well, we have the application force F, we have the equal and opposite frictional force, even when the, mat, the crate 
just begins to move. It's still going to be just equal. You're literally at that threshold, but you're still equal and opposite. And so we have no exotic. And this will be particularly F sub X max. Okay, we've reached that special value where we're just breaking away. And of course, this is going to be zero because there's no acceleration yet. You know, the crate just begins to move. So no acceleration. All right, and so quite simply, what would that be? Oh, uh, oh, not yet. Some some all forces. So what I can actually write real quickly is that the application force must be equal and opposite to F sub X S max, and I happen to know that F sub S max empirically is the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And what's the normal force? Well, I need Newton's second law for that. Again, we've said this before, but we'll do it again. Some of the forces in the y direction. Normal force is up, weight is down, and I don't expect any acceleration in the y direction. It's just sitting on the floor in the y direction, so no acceleration there. So the normal force is simply equal to mg. So I put everything together and I get that this force F is mu sub S times the normal force mg. That's what I want to calculate. So F is 0 0.760 times 60 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared. All right, so I'm kind of way up in the corner there. If I work that calculation out, I will find out that that application force to just get it, just get it moving, will be 447 newtons. That's just to get it moving. And again, I have to break it away just to get it to start moving. Part B says, we want to find that force that will slide the crate at a constant speed. Okay, so now that's a different regime. I'm going to erase this. Okay, so, I mean, it's very similar. Math is very similar in this case, but it's a different regime now. Now we're talking about constant speed. Constant speed, so again, the, the, for, the crate is sliding. Okay, and let's not even worry about constant speed. yet. Now the crate is sliding. It, it could be accelerating. So now the crate is sliding. Okay, different regime. Now I talk about kinetic friction. And I was told the kinetic friction is 0 0.410. So that's a different value. Again, empirically determined. Can't do that theoretically. So that's been done via, via experiment. Okay, so now what's different here is that the force of kinetic friction is always going to be mu sub k times the normal. It doesn't just go in equal. It doesn't matter if if your if your block is sliding if your block is sliding at constant velocity or it's accelerating. If the block is sliding at all, that is the constant frictional force it'll experience, irrespective of how fast it's going. A little bit different than what's going on in the kinetic case. I'm sorry, the static case. So. How do you how do you set set this up? Well, again, you say I apply Newton's second law in the x component. What are the forces? Again, I have an application force minus the force of kinetic friction equals. In general, it would be mass times acceleration in the x direction. And again, there can only be acceleration in the x direction, so I might as well I could probably just call it a for right now. But here's the thing. We're told 
that the crate is sliding at constant speed. Which means that the acceleration is zero. The speed is constant, means the speed's not changing. The acceleration, remember, is a change in velocity with respect to time. If your velocity or your speed particularly is not changing, you're not accelerating. So that, so that, so that means that the acceleration is zero. All right? So great. That means that the right-hand side in this case is zero. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, that way. This could be accelerating. We're just told through the information that the speed is constant. That's why I can say this. We also know this relationship too. So now that we know this, I'm going to erase these words now. Um, we have to, again, we use the same math as before. I'll just do it again. The summation of all forces in the y direction, normal force up, mg down. We don't ever expect acceleration along the y direction, so the normal force is mg. In this particular case, there's a lot of deja vu math. We would find out that the application force is equal to the force of kinetic friction, or the application force is equal to mu sub k times the normal, or the application force is mu sub k times mg. Or the application force is 0 0.410 times 60 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared. And I will find out that this time, the application force will be 241 newtons. So it takes less force to keep the block sliding at constant velocity than it does to break it away in the first place. And typically, typically we'll see I mean, typically we see we see mu sub s being greater than mu sub k, or I'm going to say greater than equal. So that's or equal. So generally speaking, it's harder to get it just moving at first, but once it's moving, it's a lot easier to maintain that motion. All right. So generally speaking, and again, this is empirical. You'll generally find if you look at tables of coefficients of friction that the kinetic friction is greater than the static friction. Okay? And again, uh, this was part B. Sorry about that. And this was, again, this was problem Cutnell Johnson 4.39. All right, I'm going to erase this. We'll do another problem. And again, you know, we're going to do, we're just going to kind of do problems that are different uh, orientations. So a lot of you have done this before. You try to figure out where to put a picture on a wall. And so you push a picture against the wall. So I'm going to look at problem, Cutnell Johnson problem 4.49. I'm going to erase all this. All right. So again, the only way to get good at physics problems is just keep doing them, right? And so, Cutnell Johnson, four point forty nine. What does it say? A person is trying to judge Whether a picture mass 
equals 1.10 kilograms. <clears throat> is pro is properly positioned by pressing it against a wall. Okay, uh, the pressing force is perpendicular to the wall. All right, um, the coefficient of static friction between the picture and the wall Picture in a wall. <clears throat> is zero point six six zero. All right. Uh, what is the minimum amount of pressing force that must be used? Okay, so a person is trying to judge whether a picture mass equals 1.10 kilograms is properly positioned by pressing it against a wall. The pressing force is perpendicular to the wall. The coefficient of static friction between the picture and the wall is 0 0.660. What is the minimum amount of pressing force that must be, that must be used? All right, so this kind of as a problem, this turns sideways, if you will. So again, let you uh, a couple more seconds here. Um, again, you can always hit the pause button. So I'm going to erase this. It's kind of like the problem we did before, but kind of turn on its side. Give you different, you know, look at things. So, um, all right. <clears throat> so what's our picture here? Well, we have a wall. We have a wall. Now put a little hash marks to determine. You know, we have a wall here. Now we're going to put a picture against the wall. So we have this picture. So let's say we have this picture here. Color it in. All right, that's our picture. Just sideways look at it, and we have x direction positive y direction now we're going to push on the wall with a pushing force f okay along the along the x direction we're going to be met with a normal force of course because we're pushing against a surface we're going to be met with a force that's equal and opposite the the, the force applied surface so the surface is going to push back on us it's going to push back by what's called the normal force. Okay? That's normal force, straight, equal and opposite. And now we have, because the picture you know, has a mass, it's gonna have a weight, mg, being, you know, pulling it straight down. And the only thing that's gonna keep it up from slipping down is that there is a frictional force, little f, that's going to oppose the weight. So again, what's going on in the, in the x direction is that is the application force F being directly opposed by the normal force 
from that the wall pushes back on on the on the pushing force. And then we have equal and opposite with the weight pulling down, and that's being met by the frictional force, whatever the coefficient of friction is. I mean, there's a coefficient of friction between, a, between a, the picture and the wall. And that's going to cause a frictional forces. And, a, and again, friction always opposes motion. Friction always works to oppose the motion or the opposed the tendency of motion. I didn't say that, but friction always works to oppose the motion or the tendency of motion. Where would the motion go if left to its own devices? Well, it'd go straight down, hit the floor, right? So again, it's not going straight down, but it would if left to its own devices. So again, friction is going to oppose it. So whatever the tendency of motion would be for it to have free fall, friction is going to go and oppose that. That's why the F is being pushed, pointed up like that. Again, I'll say that a few more times, but again, it's always important to know where friction works. Sometimes, depending upon what the what the motion is, frictional will switch will switch directions. All right. So what do we got to do? Well, we apply Newton's second law. So sum of all forces in the x direction, adding of all forces in the x direction. What are the forces? Again, I'm I'm considering this as plus x this way, and and then plus y that way. So again, F is positive, the application force. The normal force is negative. And gravity and friction work entirely in the y direction. So again, and there's no acceleration. This is a static problem. There's no acceleration. It's not accelerating in the x or y direction. So they're opposed to each other. Now, that's all Newton's second law in the, in the x direction tells us. All it tells us is that n equals f. Again, f being the application for capital F versus little f. Big F is the application force. Little f is the friction. All right, that's all I have. Then I have the sum of all forces in a y direction. Again, this is an equilibrium problem, a static problem. This picture is not moving, right? So what are the things? Well, I mean, so, so, so friction is actually in a positive direction. It's positive y. So friction up and weight down. And again, they the picture is not moving. So again, there is no acceleration. So the right-hand side of the equation is nicely zero again. And I get from the second equation that little f is just equal and opposite to the weight in this case, in this particular big problem. So we always know that this is a static problem, right? So static problem. So we're our frictional force. Again, you know, we assume that we want to find what? We want to find the um, minimum amount of pressing force. All right, so that's the pressing force that's going to be just enough to let this thing not slide. Any any little, any less force in a, in a slide. So the minimum pressing force means that, quite frankly, I am at the, I am at the, border between sliding and not sliding. That means that I would want to use F sub S max for my, because if I, if, I, if I apply a little less force, then this is going to slide. So this is because we're applying a minimum pressing force. Okay, any less force, pressing force, we'll say capital F. Any less F and the picture falls. Okay, so again, you got to read these problems carefully. So what that means is I'm at the very border of sliding and not sliding. That's why I would use the maximum force of static friction in this problem. And I use the static friction because, because it is a stationary problem. The, again, the picture is not moving. 
All right, and so what that basically means is that the frictional force that I want to use is F sub S max, which is mu sub S times the normal. What is the normal? Well, the normal happens to be the application force F in this weird problem. That means my frictional force is mu sub S times capital F because of this first equation. Okay, and what is F? Capital F, again, well, it's equal to normal force. And what's normal force? Well, again, the normal force is gonna, gonna and so it's equal to capital F. So let me put everything together, all right? And so what I now have is, I have this equation here, the second equation. Second equation will essentially say that mu sub S times the normal, is mg or n equals f mu sub s times the application force is mg okay and so finally i can actually say that the application force solving for it is just mg over mu sub s that's a little that seems a little bit weird how do I know this? Well, I applied Newton's second law in, in, in the x direction. I, get, I got the normal force is equal to the application force. Newton's second law in the y direction basically says that the frictional force is equal and opposite to the weight. And I happen to know that because the, the picture, I'm literally applying the minimum pressing force. Any harder pressing force, yeah, I'll just more securely keep the picture in place. But the minimum pressing force is that pressing force that is just enough so the picture doesn't fall. That's, the, that's F sub X max. That means that that frictional force must be F sub S max or mu sub S times the normal, as we always say. Well, in this case, it's mu sub S times F, capital F, because of this relationship. So plugging it all together, I know this relationship. So second relationship says that F is the F sub MG, but what's F? Mu sub S times the normal. It's always equal, that's equal to MG. Or and what is normal? Well, that's equal to the application force in this case. And so in that case, I can actually solve straight for the application force. I get mg divided by mu sub s. Okay, so plug in numbers now. The application force, see if I can fit it here, is what's what's the picture? 1.10 kilograms. Yeah, not be able to. I'm gonna I'm gonna erase this top equation. So the application force. Is 1.10 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared divided by 0 0.660. When I do all this, I find out that the application force that I need to apply so that the picture does not slide is 16.3. So look at this problem carefully. I mean, it can be, it can kind of easily mess you, mess up your mind a little bit because there's a lot of, lot of relationships that you normally don't see because this picture, this problem is turned sideways. But look at the problem carefully. Okay, so now, um, let's see here. I just want to. Okay, right, so what I want to do now is go to a little bit more advanced problems. To kind of tie everything together. And so let me just take a peek at what I have left to talk about. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I, I want to basically finish up by looking at a couple of advanced problems and we'll call it a done deal. Okay, so, and so again, um, you know, let's tie everything together so we can kind of really see how everything fits. All right. And so with that said, um, all right, so that's that problem there. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go to a little bit more advanced. So what I'm going to look at now is inclined plane problems. Okay, so... The inclined plane is like a wedge. I mean, it's one of the uh, seven major uh, 
uh, machines from the Renaissance. But essentially, it's something that allows you a mechanical advantage. We're not going to worry about that right now. So what happens here is that, you know, why why is it, you know, advantageous? For instance? Why would you say an incline? Well, for instance, you know, one of the, I think one of those machines is an incline plane. One's a wheel. One's a screw. Um, one's a pulley, so on and so forth. And we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But incline plane essentially is... You know, imagine if you're moving out of a house or something and, you know, you're, let's say here's the tailgate of a U-Haul truck and you have, you know, you're, you have, you know, you have stuff like on a dolly or you're just carrying boxes. Well, you can either lift to the tailgate of the U-Haul truck or you can nice, e nice and easily just, just, um, 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 roll your stuff up the incline. So it's a lot easier. That's your that's your mechanical advantage of rolling things up the incline, right? That's what you really want to do. So anyway, we're not worried about that. Um, so I want to look at a problem. I want to look at example 4.5 from OpenStax. Okay. So OpenStax. All right. That says. Um, let me just kind of write it out first. Uh, consider a skier. Um, on a slope shown, I'll, I'll, I'll draw it. Okay. Um, her mass, including equipment, is 60 kilograms. A. What is her acceleration of friction that's negligible? B. What is her acceleration of friction is known to be 45.0 newtons? Okay, uh, consider a skier on a slope shown. Okay, I haven't given you the slope, but I'll, I'll write the slope in a moment. Uh, her mass, including equipment, is 60 kilograms. A, what is her acceleration of friction that's negligible? B, what is her acceleration of friction that's known to be 45.0 newtons? All right, so take, take that here for a moment. And now let's, um, let's just get a little... I guess the sun's going down, so I got little. I have little uh, extra lights uh, on my whiteboard now. All right, so that'll disappear in a moment. So anyway, um, there you are. And so let's let's work this problem out. So the picture that we want to draw here is she's going down a slope. Okay, right triangle. Now, there's an angle theta, which we're given. And um, let's actually, let's just draw this even bigger. Let me, let me draw it kind of more for the center here. So again, let's just look at this, analyze this picture. Very important to look at this picture very carefully. 
we're going to use this a lot in this class. So this analysis is going to is going to repeat over and over again in this class. Let's understand how it. I can't draw right now. How it is done. Try to draw a right triangle. All right. So here we go. Right triangle. And we have a mass on this sliding mass on this um, on this incline. We'll say this incline is at an angle of theta. All right. Now. What we want to do is, you know, we could now. So, what are the forces involved in this problem? Well, we have a normal force that'll be perpendicular to the surface of this incline. Again, a force, a normal force, is always perpendicular to the surface. We have weight mg that's going to go straight down. All right, so that's going to happen, and any kind of acceleration. And any frictional force is going to go along the incline. So we have to make a trade-off. We can either use the regular, we can either use a regular Cartesian system. And we can use the one where we have plus x, minus x, plus y, and minus y. We can use that system. But if we use that system, what's the what's the situation? Well. The normal force is going to have two components. Um, the frictional force, if there is one, will have two components. It's at an angle. And the acceleration direction and velocity and any other kinematic variables is going to be along the, the incline. It's going to be along the incline. It's going to have two components. So the, so the issue is the only thing that's going to be simple is gravity, is weight. Weight will be straight down the y direction. So I have all, everything. So the only thing simple will be the weight, and everything else is going to be complicated. So maybe I should choose a coordinate system that's a little bit more advantageous for me. So let's not use this one. Let's use a tilted coordinate system instead. Let's take my coordinate system and tilt it by an angle theta so that what I can say now is that this is my positive x-axis along the incline and my, and my positive y-axis is along the normal. It's perfectly okay to do that. Again, it doesn't matter. I'm just an observer. I can choose whatever coordinate system that best benefits me, which is most, most advantageous to me. And so all I'm doing is I'm taking a coordinate system that I had before and rotating it. That's it. It's a perfectly legitimate coordinate system. It's a rotated coordinate system. Perfectly legitimate. Now what happens? Now, all my velocity, my acceleration will all be entirely in the x direction. My frictional force will all be entirely in the x direction. My normal force will all be in the y direction. The only trade-off I have is I have to put the, the weight into components. That's my trade-off. All right. And so how do I do that? Well, I do that by drawing my new coordinate. Here's my new Y. And here's my new X. Now, you can convince yourself that if I were to continue drawing this weight vector down, I'd form a right triangle which means that this angle that I'm pointing at will be 90 minus theta, right? Because three triangles have to form a, a right triangle, three angles have to, have to form 180 degrees. This is already 90 degrees, so this would be 90 minus theta. And of course, this angle and this angle are complementary, which means that this angle right here is theta. That angle, that vertex of that little triangle for the weight, the weight triangle, is theta. So that means that this component is mg sine of theta. The magnitude times the sine of the angle, sine of theta. Again, it's the opposite, right? And this component right here, 
along my new y is mg cosine theta. Remember, I'm making components based upon my new x and my new y, my rotated x and my rotated y. Those are my new coordinates. Those are the coordinates I'm going to use to work on this problem. So I, all I'm really doing is, is taking the weight and expressing in terms of components of, of this new coordinate system. The only trade-off I have is all the other forces are nice and easy. All the, all the kinematics are entirely along X. The frictional force is entirely along X. The normal force is entirely along Y. The only trade-off is I have to break up the weight into two components. All right, well, that's a to me, that's a good trade-off. All right, and I am perfectly legitimate in doing that because I am free to choose whatever coordinate system best fits me. Sometimes I choose an upside-down Y. Sometimes I choose, you know, in this case, I'm going to choose a nice, you know, a nice tilted coordinate system. In the next chapter, chapter 5, we'll see that we'll choose a spherical polar coordinate system that works best for us. But again, this is a convenient system for us. You know, we're just humans observing the situation. Okay, so what do I want now? Now that I got my new coordinate system, I'm, I mean, I want to know what's the acceleration of friction is, is negligible. Well, I'll apply Newton's laws just like I did before. So the sum of all forces in the x direction of my new x, my rotated x. What forces are in that direction? Again, I don't care about friction right now, so it doesn't matter. The only force that actually, you know what I mean, what are the forces in this problem? Normal force and weight, right? That's it. Friction's not even, it's not a player in this particular problem. Normal force and weight. But not the whole weight, just the component along the x direction. So if I call this positive x going up the ramp, down the ramp is negative x. So it's going to be negative mg sine of theta, the component of the weight along the x-axis, my new tilted x-axis. That's the only force that's there. I mean, normal force is entirely in my new y direction, and I'm not considering friction here. So again, um, that is really the only force I have to worry about here. And I'm going to say that's equal to MA. In this case, uh, there, there's, no, there's no acceleration along my new Y direction. I don't expect the, the mass to be going through the, through the uh, platform or through the incline. So the only acceleration as long as, I'm just going to, instead of calling it A sub X, I realize the only acceleration in this problem is just going to be along my new X. Again, I chose a coordinate system such that I, I can have all my kinematics nice and simple along a single coordinate. That's why I chose this coordinate system. Okay. And so with, with that said, what's nice is that I can automatically cancel out these M's. And for this first problem, I get just that A is negative G sine of theta. And I'm told um, that uh, theta is 25 degrees. Again, this is, I'm actually not told. This, if you look at the picture in the book, this is actually 25 degrees. I apologize. This is actually a given. So A is negative 9.80 meters per second squared times the sine of 25 degrees. And so A, we'll find this negative 4.1 4 meters per second squared or 4.1 meters per second squared down the incline. That's what negative means in this case, down the incline. All right. So again, that's a, that's if I don't include friction, I'll, I don't even need the second equation if I'm not including friction. Okay. So again, using this nice new coordinate system, I'm able to do that. What happens, though, in Part B if I include friction? Now what happens? Well, now we have an extra term. All right. Actually, before we do anything even further, let's do a, you know, a sanity test. What happens if I make 
the angle 90 degrees. I would expect free fall, right? Well, sine of 90 is 1, 9.8 meters second squared. So again, and if I make and, and if I make the uh, angle 0 degrees, I wouldn't expect this thing to accelerate at all. Well, is that true? 9.8 meters second is sine of 0, 0. So I wouldn't have acceleration at all. So again, again, you, you always want to kind of try, you know, look at physical plausibility. You know, you want to see if, you know, if, if things make sense. Okay, now I'm going to go and, and do part B. Now I'm going to imply, imply a friction. All right. So, so again, let's kind of redo this now. Now we got to say that friction now exists. So what's it going to, what's it going to be now? While friction exists, my tendency is to move down. The tendency of the block is to move down the incline. Friction always wants to oppose motion or the tendency of motion. That means that the friction, if the tendency of the block is to move down the incline, that means in this case, the friction is going to be directed up the incline. It always wants to oppose motion or the tendency of motion. All right, so my equation would then be summation of all forces in the x direction, all right, is going to be, um, uh, what are my forces now? All right, well, my forces are going to be negative mg sine of theta. That's the component of the weight along x, and it will be opposed by f, and I'm being told what f is. I was, I was told the problem is 45, 45 newtons. And it's going to equal m a. And again, I don't put a I don't put a subscript on a because all the motions in the x direction, right? So if I solve this now, I find out that a is going to be f little f minus m g sine of theta everything divided by m. All right. So I was told that the friction is known to be 45 newtons minus mg, mass of gear is 60 kilograms, times gravitational acceleration 9.80 meters per second squared times the sine of 25 degrees. Everything is divided by 60 kilograms. If I work that out and I include friction, I should slow down a little bit. My acceleration should not be as much. And I found out that it's down to negative 3.35 meters per second squared. Now, what's that negative sign mean? It means 3.35 meters per second squared down the incline. That's what that means. So if I put friction in the problem, you're going to see that your acceleration is going to go down. Okay. Um, I'm going to work a couple of problems that are more advanced that kind of show, put everything together. So I'm getting these weird lights that are appearing now on my, as the sun's changing positions. All right, so um, so let's let's work that out. So I'm gonna couple problems that I looked up in another textbook, and I think you know it, it kind of. I mean, I think it's Cutnell Johnson and OpenStack sometimes don't make me happy, so I try to find problems in other sources. And so I'll just kind of, I'll just call these example one and example two. So example one. Okay, I want to tie everything together. All right. So example one says, okay, so I'm going to draw the picture here. So I, I have a, a block. I have a block and an incline. Well, let me just draw it over here, I guess. All right. I have a block on an incline, so let's try to be careful here. We're, we're not too used to use of this yet. So 
rectangle. I have a block. Now, um, it says, if I can write this out here, a block weighing 80 newtons. That's a map, that's the weight of my block. Rests on a plane. Inclined at 20 degrees to the horizontal. Okay, just like the picture shows. The coefficient of static friction is 0 0.25. And involves some friction here. While the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.15. Okay. Um, a, what is the, okay, so let's be very careful about these problems, okay? Let's read them very carefully and know exactly what we're being asked. A, what is the minimum force F? Cap F. Parallel to the plane. Um, that'll start the block moving up the plane. I'm sorry. That will prevent the block slipping down the plane. Sorry about that. That will prevent the block. Moving down the plane. Okay. B. I can fit all this here. B. What is the minimum force F that will start the block moving up the plane? Sorry about my hand running here. C. There actually is a C. And that is what it what force F is required to move the block up the plane at constant velocity.
Just barely. All right, so again, let me read this to you slowly. A block weighing 80 newtons rests on a plane inclined at 20 degrees to the horizontal. This is 20 degree angle. Okay, so this is mass. We're told basically mg is 80 newtons. Okay. The coefficient of static friction is 0 0.25. Okay, that means that mu sub s is 0 0.25. Coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.15. Mu sub k is 0 0.15. It's between the block and the incline. Hey, what is the minimum force F parallel to the plane? So again, we're going to apply some force F parallel to the plane. What is a minimum force F parallel to the plane that will prevent the block from moving down the plane? B, what is the minimum force F that will start the block moving up the plane? And C, what force F is required to move the block at a constant velocity? So again, what are the questions? What is the minimum force F parallel to the to the plane that will prevent the block from moving down the plane b what is the minimum force f that will start the block moving up the plane c what force f is required to move the block at a constant velocity and that's actually up the plane move up the plane at a constant velocity all right Sorry, I don't have enough space. So, all right. So again, well, I'll kind of write things out as we go along. So, so there's the whole question. We know, we know certain information. We we're given the coefficient of static friction. We're given the coefficient of kinetic friction. So this is kind of, I'll kind of like, you know, it's a lot of words. I understand. So let's just kind of uh, go one step at a time. We got to be very careful how we read this. Very careful how we interpret it. Okay, and so what this said is first and foremost, all right, so let's write this a little bit neater. Uh, we're told that the weight of this block is 80 newtons. So if I want to find the mass, it'd be 80 newtons divided by G, or the mass is 80 newtons divided by 9.80 meters per second squared. So I can know right off the bat that the mass is going to be 8.16 kilograms. Let's just work that out. So uh, information that I need to remember is mg is 80 newtons. The mass is 8.16 kilograms. The coefficient of static friction between the block and the and, and the incline is 0 0.25. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the incline is 0 0.15. Okay, these are important little pieces of information to remember. All right. Now, the first question is, let's rewrite it real quick to make sure. So I want to find out what is the minimum force F. And doing part A. What is the minimum force F um, <clears throat> parallel to the plane that will Prevent the block from slipping down the plane. Okay, that's what I want to know. All right, and so. What does that mean? Well, essentially means that 
you know, the, the, really the question would be without, um, so without the applied force, you know, what would actually be the, what, what would actually be the behavior? So without the applied force, you know, would the block slip down the plane? I mean, the big question would really be is that, well, if I were to take the summation, so let's let's kind of, so again, keep an eye on what we're doing here. We want to, we want to prevent the blocks of down, but we have to do a little pre-analysis first, right? So let's kind of, uh, let's figure out, well, is this even a problem? All right. And so if I don't apply a force, I mean, what would happen? So let's kind of say that, you know, what happens if the applied force is zero? We just kind of don't look at the problem. Well, you know, what we actually have, we know the coefficient of static friction is bigger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. So what do we actually have slippage? All right, all right. So that's a big question. So we have the sum of all forces in the x direction would be what? Again, we're gonna we're gonna go back and do our regular analysis. Again, we're we have a slant, we're gonna use our slanted coordinate systems, our tilted coordinate systems, coordinate system. And so our positive x direction is out the incline. And our normal force and our y direction is, I mean, our normal force is along the new y direction. And again, weight is always down, but we have these new coordinates, right? And so this is gonna be mg. Again, this is also 20 degrees or theta in this case. So we're gonna have mg sine of theta for the, the component along the along the uh, plane and mg cosine theta for the component along the new y-axis. Some of force in the, in the x direction. Again, we're not applying the, we're just gonna see if, if, if we have a problem, all right? So some of force in the x direction. Well, let's see, we've got negative mg sine of theta. Again, that's the only force right now. And we do have friction. We're gonna assume, we're gonna look at worst case scenario. Do we actually exceed the maximum force of static friction? So we'll say minus F sub S max. Again, actually it would be plus. Why? Because if gravity, if your motion Again, we're, we're saying that this big F is zero, right? Left its own devices, the block will slide down the incline. So again, friction will oppose motion or the tendency of motion. Tendency of motion is kind of would be going down the incline, so that F sub X max, so it have to be up the incline or positive, right? Equals zero. Okay, that's your X direction equation. And that would say, well, okay, so in my breaking point analysis, F sub X max would then equal MG sine of theta. And, you know, and the big question then would be, okay, well, you know, <clears throat> what we what we want to actually see is, is what F sub X max, you know, how would that compare, you know, in this breaking point? So we would actually have slippage. So slippage would occur Slipping would occur if basically mg sine of theta was greater than or equal to f sub s max, right? Or in this case, we would look at the other equation. Now would be the summation of all forces in the y direction well, that would equal what? That'll equal um, uh, normal force up minus mg cosine theta down. Again, mg cosine theta is the only component of the weight in the, wide, in, the, in the new y direction. That's equal to zero. And so the normal force 
will be mg cosine of theta. Again, the only force, the only forces in this problem in the y direction are the normal force up and the component of the of the of the weight in the y direction. So we're asking the following question. We know that F sub S max is equal to mu sub S times the normal, right? And so we're asking the question then, if we're asking if mg sine of theta is greater than or equal to F sub X max, well, the equivalent question is, is it equal to, is it greater than or equal to mu sub S times the normal? And we know what the normal is, it's mg cosine theta. So the equivalent question combining everything together is, is mg sine of theta greater than or equal to mg cosine of theta? Or, I'm sorry, mu sub s mg cosine of theta. Mu sub s times the normal. All right, so you got the mgs. They cancel out. So the question is, well, is sine of theta greater equal to mu sub s times cosine of theta? That's really the question I need to ask. So I'll erase this. Well, let's just work this out if I have slippage. So in this case, um, sine of theta, well, this is sine of 20 degrees. Is that greater than or equal to, uh, what's mu sub s, 0 0.15? times cosine 20. Well, the sine of 20 in my calculator is 0.342. Is that greater or equal to cosine 20? 0.939 times 0.15, 0 0.140. Yep. So that means without without considering anything, this thing will just naturally want to slide down the incline. There's no doubt about it. 0.15 times cosine of 20. I would 0.342 is indeed greater greater than 0 0.140. So there will be sliding unless I do something about it. All right. So I got to prevent that from happening. So indeed, there will be sliding. All right. And so. I have to prevent that sliding from happening. All right, so that's the first problem. I need to say, okay, you know what? Let's set this thing up and let's, let's hold it in place in such a way that sliding does not occur. So I am in the static case in that, case, in, a, in, a, in that situation. So I have to sit there and I have to, I have to, do, it, I have to do an application force such that sliding does not occur. Okay, so again, I've shown that if left to its own devices, yeah, this thing will this thing will not only slide down, it'll accelerate down the incline. It'll it'll, it'll go gangbusters, right? So, um, so we didn't we didn't we did we did show that. So now what I want what I want to do is um, I want to uh, consider a situation where um, let's see here. Um, where I want to apply a force now to prevent this from happening. So I'm going to set the problem in place. Okay, I don't want movement. So I just kind of want to just set things nicely in place. I don't want sliding. So that means now is that I now I'm going to apply this force. Now, left to its own devices again, the system is going to want to slide down the incline. So in this particular situation, my frictional force and my application force are going to go the same direction because the system has the tendency to want to slide down the incline. So given, so again, the frictional force always opposes motion or the tendency of motion. So in this case, they're in, they're in the same direction. So in this case, now I'll say, okay, well, now I, I want this set, set so that no motion occurs. So that means now that summation, applying Newton's second law, the summation of all force in the x direction. 
is going to be the application force in the positive x direction plus the frictional force. This would actually be a static frictional force because I'm trying to get a static problem. And then what? And what are the? What's the other? Uh, what's the other uh, player? Well, it would be the. It would be the x component of the weight. And it would be going down the incline, which the orientation that I choose is negative. That's minus mg sine of theta. And I don't want movement. That means my right-hand side of the equation, there's no acceleration. So the right-hand side is zero. Okay, that's my Newton's uh, second law in the x direction. Okay. <clears throat> now... Sec, Newton's second law in the y direction, again, I've already, I've already done this, I'll do it one more time, is that what are my forces in the y direction? Well, normal, up, and the only other force in the y direction is going to be the y component of the weight. Again, that's going to be mg cosine theta, and that's going to be pointed down. And again, I don't expect the block to accelerate through the incline, so certainly there will not ever be an acceleration in that direction. So along my new y, that's zero. So again, the normal force in an in a inclined plane problem like this is generally mg cosine of theta. And I just remember that. Okay, so what am I being asked? Well, I want to apply a force such that the object does not move. So I want... I think it's the minimum force, if I recall. I want to apply um, now. What's the minimum force? When I see words like minimum, then you're really talking about you know on the border, if you will. So I want to apply a minimum force F such that. The object, the block does not move. All right, so that means if I apply any less force, then we have sliding, which I'm trying to avoid. So what does that mean? That means I apply that means if I apply any more force, I will I will certainly not get movement. If I play any less force, I'll start having slide. That means I want to use what? For my frictional force, I want to use the maximum force of static friction. Because I'm right there on the, on the threshold. And we know what that is, right? That's the mu sub s times the normal. It always is. That's an empirical relationship. And I found a normal force, right? I know what that is. That's mg cosine theta. So that's going to be m, oops, mu sub s mg cosine theta. Again, my particular normal force, you know, again, when you have a box just sitting on the ground, we always say it's mg, right? Well, it's not mg. It's only the force of the surface pushing up against the, the object. In this case, in an in a, in a inclined plane situation, the normal force depends on this angle. So it's mu sub s. Mg cosine of theta. That is what the force of friction is. All right, that's what information I get from the y equation. Okay, so again, remember, the force of friction is the force of static friction max. I can actually write max here. <clears throat> and then I know what that is. That's mu sub s times the normal. That's that breaking point force frictional force. And what is the normal? I figured it out from the applying Newton's second law in the y direction. That's mu sub s mg cosine theta. That's all the information I get from the definition or from the empirical uh, statement of what the maximum friction, frictional force, uh, maximum force static friction is and what the normal force is from the, uh, from the uh, analysis in the y direction. So I'm going to erase all this. I'm going to take that information and stick it right there. And, and so I'm going to combine everything together and erase all of this, and I got all this information, all the information I got from applying Newton's second law in the y direction, all the information I got 
from this maximum force static friction. And so what I'm going to now say is that I have the application force F plus mu sub S mg cosine theta. Again, that's all the analysis I just got done doing. I'm just substituting it right there. Minus mg sine of theta equals zero. And now I will solve for the application force. So simple algebra, is throwing everything on the other side. The application force F will be um, mg sine of theta. I'm throwing it on the other side. It becomes positive. Throwing this term on the other side becomes negative. Minus mu sub s mg cosine theta. And what I can now do is I can factor out the mg. So force now is mg times parentheses uh, sine of theta minus mu sub s cosine of theta. All right, now I'm ready to plug in some numbers. Force, okay, mg, we're told what mg is, right? 80 newtons, yes. That's how much my box weighs. Times brackets, so I'm just going to use brackets now. Uh, I have the sine of the 20 degree angle, and that's 20 degrees, minus uh, mu sub s. I was told that was mu sub s. Remember, it's a static problem. I got to use the 0 0.25 this time, times the cosine of 20 degrees. Great. I do all of this stuff, I will find out that that minimum force that I need to get it to prevent it from moving ends up being 8.57 newtons. That is the force that I apply just to keep this system from not moving, to keep it from not sliding down the incline, 8.57 newtons. Okay? Now, um, I have a new problem. That's part A. Again, that is the minimum force needed, minimum application force needed to meet, to prevent the block from sliding down the incline. Okay, what's part B tell me? It's a little bit something. Again, you got to read this problem extremely carefully to determine what regime you're in and what is it that you're doing. Because if you don't read it carefully, you're not going to do the right problem and you'll get a wrong answer. Okay, so the second part of this problem, part B, says... Okay, I'm going to write it out because you know, this thing has a billion words to it. Part B, remember, was what is the minimum force, F? <clears throat> uh, that will start the block moving up the plane. up the plane. All right, now we want to actually start motion. What I've done before is I just prevented the, I just prevented the motion. I just prevented the block from doing what it naturally wants to do and that's slide down the plane. Now I want to reverse things. I'm going to go from the defense to now to the offense. Now I actually want to move the block, start, just start moving it up the plane. Now the block is in a stationary situation. Okay, uh, the block is in a stationary situation. All right, and so um, what's going to happen now is that I want to just get it starting going up the plane. And um, I, want to re I want to essentially just start moving the block. That means it's stationary. And we want to get it to just start moving. That means it's still in a static situation. And I want to start applying a force and applying a force, applying a bigger and bigger force. And I'm going to be met now with the static friction going the other way. Because now that I'm going on, on the offense, I'm essentially applying a force such that the force of static friction is going to oppose it. And eventually it's going to break away. I'm going to be able to break away and start moving the block 
up the incline. So what's going to happen now is, remember, the force of friction is always opposing motion or the tendency of motion. So now the force of friction is going to go the other direction. So force is adding friction the other direction. It's, it's, going to, it's going to change signs. Instead of going up the incline, now it's going to go down the incline because now I'm trying to apply a force now that's trying to get it to move. And it's, trying, it's going to get it to just move up the incline, which means that I'm going to reach that breaking point, which means that that F sub X is actually going to be the F sub S max, which is mu sub S times the normal again. So again, Sat, for, frictional force is always in the direction to oppose motion, and now I'm trying. I'm going from defense to offense. I'm actually trying to, I'm actually trying to get the block to barely move. Now I'm pushing and pushing and pushing to the point where I'm just just getting motion to start. So I'm just breaking it away from the static static realm. Sorry. So how do I do this now? So again, it's just applying Newton's second law, but again, reading the problem very, very carefully. So we apply Newton's second law in the x direction. And what do we do now? Well, we're gonna essentially, applying Newton's second law in the x direction is gonna be that there's gonna be a change of, um, a, a, a change of personality, if you will, to the uh, frictional force. F is still going to go up the incline. But now, as I said, it's F sub S down the incline because it's got to oppose this new tendency of motion is what? To move up the incline. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to push it up the incline now. So it's going to oppose me. And again, weight is always going to be the way it's been. Mg sine of theta going to zero. And again, just because, I mean, there is no acceleration because the because I'm literally not moving. I'm in a situation where I'm just barely getting motion. So in fact, let me clean this up a little bit and say this actually is effectively F sub S max. Okay. And again, the Y component algebra is exactly the same as it was before. I'm just gonna write it down. Your Y component, Remember, all it tells you is that n equals mg cosine theta. That's what your y component tells you. Again, you know, you can do it over and over again. It's deja vu. So what's happening now is that f sub x max is going to be mu sub s times normal because I'm reaching that breaking point again. Or what's normal? Oh, it's an iso inclined plane problem. So it's always mg cosine theta. So it's mu sub s mg cosine of theta. All right, so combine everything together. What I get now, rewriting this equation, is I get the x equation becomes f minus mu sub s mg cosine of theta minus mg sine of theta equals zero. I'm going to throw everything on the other side. F is mu sub S mg cosine of theta plus mg sine of theta equals zero. And I can pull out the mg. F is mg, again, has parentheses, mu sub S cosine of theta plus the sine of theta. And now I'm ready to write a final equation on this. And I'm looking for, you know, so essentially <clears throat> F, what is MG? It's, well, let me, let me just erase a few things here. So again, you got this algebra, running out of space. All right, so here we are. F, MG, I remember is 80 Newtons. And then it's going to be mu sub s. I'm still using 0.25 because it's a static case. Cosine 20 degrees plus the sine of 20 degrees. All right. And um, 
And that's going to be, if I work all this stuff out, work all this out, I get uh, 46.2 newtons. So I need to apply 8.57 newtons to prevent the motion. If I want to just get it to start moving up the plane, I need to apply 46.2 newtons. All right, and now there's a part C to this problem. In part C, okay, so again, this just gets me to try to just barely get motion up the plane. Part C says, okay, so let me erase this now. All right, so part C now says, um, um, what, it, what force F is required to move the block up the plane at constant velocity? What force F is required uh, to move the block up the plane with constant velocity. Okay, now let's think about what we're doing now. So, so now we've broken away and now we don't need as much force to actually have it going, uh, to have it sliding. So now we're in the sliding friction regime. So, so now we're talking about sliding or kinetic friction realm. Remember, there's a static friction realm and the kinetic friction realm. Okay, now we're sliding. Now we could be sliding with acceleration. In this case, it's asking us about constant velocity, which means that the acceleration is zero. All right, and so let's set up our, our Newton's laws again. Okay, so now we're in the kinetic case. Now, in general, Newton's second law in the x direction will be what? Sum of all forces. Now, it's just basically the same situation, but now this is kinetic friction, F sub K. So the force is going to be, you know, we're going to be sliding the block up the plane. And, of course, friction always opposes the motion or the tendency of motion. In this case, there actually is motion. So, the, so some of all forces in the x direction is going to be the application force up, going up, minus the force of kinetic friction going down the plane, which I have def, which I have deemed as a negative x direction, and of course minus mg sine of theta. Normally, that's m a sub x, right? But that's there's normally there'll be acceleration there, but given that I, I was told that there's con, there's constant velocity again constant velocity means zero acceleration. That means that this is zero over here, and again my y component equation is always mg cosine theta. Again there's again the, the mathematics is the same with the inclined plane, so I can just write it down. I mean again I could say that. Summational force in the y direction, blah, 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 but I, I get this result. Now, as always, the kinetic frictional force is mu sub k times the normal. There's no breaking or anything like that. There is just a constant kinetic frictional force. That's the difference between the behavior. All right, and so I know the normal force. So it's going to, for the inclined plane, so it's going to be mu sub k, mg, uh, oops, cosine of theta. All right, so this becomes more deja vu type physics here. We've done we've done the uh, we've done it, which is just a little bit different situation. And so what I what I can now get is that if I plug all this into the top equation, I will now get F minus mu sub k mg cosine theta um, minus. Um, mg sine of theta equals zero. I'll throw all the terms on the other side. 
F equals mu sub K. Mg cosine of theta plus Mg sine of theta. I can pull out the, I can factor out the Mg. I have Mg times parentheses. Mu sub K cosine of theta plus the sine of theta. Finally, I can write the numbers in. Force is equal to, um, is equal to 80 newtons times brackets, 0 0.15. I use the kinetic frictional coefficient now because I now am sliding. It's, you know, you, when you're in sliding motion, you use the for you use the kinetic you use the coefficient of kinetic friction. All right, times cosine of twenty degrees plus the sine of twenty degrees. Finally, we would find that the force now to keep it going at a constant velocity is thirty eight point six newton. All right, that's the force to keep it going at constant velocity, 38.6 newtons. All right, so I'm going to do uh, another example uh, where we're using the, uh, um, you know, the, the basic concepts we learned today. So this next example, um, I'll call it example two. And let me draw a little picture here. So I have a, an inclined plane. Now, what I have, I'm going to put, I'm going to put tension here now. So I'm going to have a block I call block B. And I have a little pulley. Make it a little bit higher. And on the other side of this pulley is a block that's going to hang straight down. If I can try to draw this right. Straight down. I'll call this block A. Okay. And uh, the angle here is going to be 45 degrees in this problem. All right. And this is a right triangle. So, again, another incline. All right. So, now, and this is a pulley. in the. Pulley is assumed massless and frictionless. So again, pulley is assumed to be massless and frictionless. All right, so <clears throat> what is the problem now? Um, so it says that body B weighs 100 pounds. We're going to use the old English units in this problem. Body B weighs 100 pounds and body A weighs 32 pounds. All right, and um, the coefficients of friction between B and the incline are, so we're going to have some friction in here, the coefficients of friction between B and the incline are um, mu sub s equals 0 0.56 and 
mu sub k is 0 0.25. A. Find the acceleration of B moving up the incline. Oops. Hang on one second. Skip uh skip that. B A, A is find acceleration of the system. If B is initially at rest. B is. <clears throat> find the acceleration if B is moving up the incline. Let me write it over here. C is find acceleration of B is moving down the incline. Okay. I'm gonna put a little line right here, so you know. <clears throat> All right. So again, body B weighs 100 pounds, and body A weighs 32 pounds. The coefficients of friction between bo for, between B and the incline are mu sub s is 0 0.56, and mu sub k is 0 0.25. And mu sub s is a coefficient of static friction, mu sub k is a coefficient of kinetic friction. A part A. Um, find the acceleration of the system if B is initially at rest. Uh, part B is find the acceleration of B is moving up the incline. C is find the acceleration of B is moving down the incline. Okay, so three different problems. <clears throat> all right, so um, all right, so I'm going to erase what we have here. And again, you know, like the previous problem. We want to be very careful about how we're reading things. So again, so keep it, you know, keep a track of what we're doing here, and then we're gonna, I'm just gonna kind of uh, start working this. All right. So first and foremost, um, <clears throat> now the first problem is kind of okay. So we gotta we gotta kind of think of this thing here. So we have. Now, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to make the assumption that maybe the, the system will naturally want to move down the incline, right? But at any rate, one of the points of the, of the pulley being massless and frictionless is that the purpose of a pulley is to redirect the force, right? So the purpose of a pulley, again, another one of the special machines from the Renaissance, um, is to redirect a force. Now there is a tension force that'll be in this in this in this rope or cable. So and for B, the tension force is actually going to be up again. It's it's a tension force, and and again, it's directed right along the cable. And on the other side of the pulley, the same tension force will be redirected and will essentially act straight up on, on a block A. And it'll be the exact same tension force. If the pulley was not massless and frictionless, then the tension force would not be the same. 
All right. So again, given that the pulley is massless and frictionless, essentially it's going to the tension on either side of the of the pulley, the tension throughout the entire cable will be the same. All right. So what we want to do is we want to essentially divide this problem into two pieces. We want to do a force diagram, a free body diagram for each piece. And so we want to do, first of all, the block B piece. Okay, look at, let's look at block B. Well, what's block B look like? Well, again, we strip away the rest of the universe and just wor worry about block B. We're going to do a free body diagram. So again, we're going to look at a free body diagram. All right. For, um, <clears throat> for block B. So kind of redraw things here. Again, I don't, I don't really need the incline, but I'm just trying, I'm drawing it for <coughs> uh, for the for the sake of uh, context. 45 degree angle. Let's draw this a little bit bigger. All right, I have block B. Now, again, there's a weight that's going to go straight down. I'll call it M sub B G. We have new axes. Remember, we're, it's an it's a inclined plane. So I have a new Y axis. Um, normal along is basically directed along the normal to the surface. The surface normal is going to be going along Y. <clears throat> and then uh, there's going to be friction and... Essentially, if I'm going to make the assumption, we're going to assume that the system will uh, tend to have B slide down the incline. All right, so that's the tendency. That's what we're going to assume that the tendency of the system is that B slide down the incline, which means that we will we know that there will be a tension force along the what I now call I'm going to now call this the positive x axis. There will be a tension force along the positive x axis, but at the same time, the frictional force will be directed that way as well. Okay, both those forces are going to be directed up. A normal force, and again, with the new axes, the new x and the new y, I'm going to have an m sub b g sine of theta. Again, this is going to be theta, or 45 degrees in this case. So I'll just call it theta right now, but we know, we know that theta is 45 degrees. Okay, so we, just, we know that. Uh, and of course, the the uh, component along the new y direction will be m sub b g cosine of theta. All right. So again, we're breaking this thing out, and so we want to know essentially. I mean, the first problem is essentially telling us um, find the acceleration of the system if b is initially at rest. So right now, right now, b is initially at rest. That means that b is initially not moving, all right? And so if that's the case, um, it is in a state of static, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not moving and its tendency would be to move down the, down the incline. <clears throat> so I mean, at least that's what we're gonna assume. If we're wrong, all our answers will just have, will be negative and they'll just tell us we're wrong. It's okay, you know, we guessed wrong. So essentially now we, we're in a situation where Initially, the block is not moving. So that means that initially the block is going to be considered static. <clears throat> so, um, in that in that particular situation, you know we're gonna we're do the uh, sum of all forces. We're gonna do Newton's second law, sum of all forces in the x direction. Okay, <clears throat> as usual. 
So what's Newton's second law going to tell us? Well, it tells us that T is in the positive direction plus F, little f, that's the frictional force, minus M sub G sine of theta. <clears throat> and again, it, we're going to have an acceleration this time. It's going to be M. Now, we're, we're making the assumption now, we're making the assumption that the system is going to move down the y-axis. I'm actually going to apply now an orientation to this motion. I'm making the assumption that the acceleration is going to be negative. So again, what the acceleration becomes now, it, the A is just now going to be a number the way I'm doing this analysis. So I'm going to make the assumption that the direction of motion is going to be down the negative, the, the negative x-axis, right? So again, assume... Why am I doing this? Because <clears throat> I, I need to make sure that I coordinate between both B and A. So right now, A is just going to be a number. So assume <clears throat> the um, motion of B is down incline. That's why I'm doing this. I have to coordinate between B and A. I can't just say, oh, I'll just let it, I'll just assume positive and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, let the, let the system work itself out. Now I have to coordinate between B and A. So now I'm going to make the assumption here that I'm now going to say that everything is going up. So B is going down the incline, which means that A is going to have to move up. They're both tied together. All right. And so that's why it's important to me to say this. <clears throat> and in the y direction, again, y direction is going to be deja vu. Y direction is nothing more than the usual normal forces up. Mg cosine theta is down. And again, for the block B, I never, I would never expect uh, um, acceleration through the incline. And so I would normally get that, again, the normal is, and again, I, I apologize, it's M sub B G. So N minus M sub B G cosine theta. So N is going to be M sub B G cosine of theta. Okay, again, the usual. <clears throat> so that's the equation that I have. And so what so that's that's what I get. If I plug everything together now, putting it all together, um, now one of the things I have to I have to understand is that um, that the force of static friction, <clears throat> if 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 again, if we just begin to move, so again, if the system just begins to move, we're at that critical point. That means that the F is particularly mu sub s times the normal. Okay? <clears throat> so, and again, that's mu sub s times m to b g cosine theta. We plug all that information together. We can rewrite everything as one equation. So again, I'm going to, instead of F, I'm going to understand that if the system is literally just beginning to move, that this is F sub S max. It's S for static because the system was initially at rest. We're applying a force that's big enough just to get it moving. Just to get it moving. That's the F sub S max, which is equal to mu sub S times the normal. We've been through this before. And the normal is what? M sub B G cosine theta. I put all that together. And I write instead one equation that describes block B. The motion of block B, we describe by one equation. <clears throat> and it'll be that T plus mu sub S M sub B G cosine of theta minus M sub B G sine of theta equals negative m sub b a. Again, I just, I don't put an a sub x there because that's the purpose of me having these, these tilted coordinate systems. So I don't need to actually uh, talk about, I mean, all my acceleration is going to be going along the x direction. That's why I chose this, this system. So this is my equation in the x direction. 
all right? That's for block B. So, so again, for block B, I'll just kind of write it up. I'm gonna erase a lot of the stuff. What I now have is the, I did a free body diagram for block B. I just, I literally took block B out of the universe and said, what forces act on block B? And let me apply Newton's second law just to block B, okay? So for block B, I now have this generalized equation. So let's write it separately. Again, I'm gonna have to kind of do, you know, fancy uh, saving. <clears throat> so block B's equation, I'll put a little B for block B is T, and I'm gonna actually solve it for the, for the tension force for futuristic reasons. So um, T is M's, M, C, it's, T is gonna be, um, um, Negative m sub b a, okay, oops, negative m sub b a, let me write this a little bit better. <clears throat> so for block b, t is negative m sub b a, okay, and it's already over there, and I'm going to throw everything else on the other side. So it's going to be, um, Minus uh, mu sub s m sub b g cosine theta all right and then plus m sub b g sine of theta i mean that's what i have now okay so i got that equation from block b okay i'm just going to save it up there I'm not going to go look at block A. <clears throat> block A is the hanging mass, and it's going to have a separate free body diagram. So I'm going to look at A now. So what's A look like? Well, it's just going to be a hanging mass. There's not going to be any X component. The only direction is possibly going to be in Y. So I made the assumption. So again, in this particular situation, I'm going to say that Y is positive. The only direction that block A possibly has is in the Y direction. So I'm going to make the assumption here that if I made the assumption that B naturally is going to go down the incline plane, that means that A and B have to go together. So B is going down, A is going up. That means that block A is going to be assumed to move up. So again, tension's up, weight's always down, so M sub AG, and the acceleration is, is assumed positive. And there is only why there's only one equation for this because there is no there's no motion in, in any x direction. The, the the motion for the for the block A is only going to be in the y direction. So Newton's second law in the y direction is all I have for this one. <clears throat> What's it going to be? Well, it's going to be T up minus m sub a g going down. And if I'm making the assumption like I did before, that the block B is going down the incline, that means the block A is going up the incline. That's going to, that means that's going to be a positive M sub A, A. And it's going to be the same A. They're going to accelerate together. They're going to be the same acceleration together. They're going to accelerate to, um, you know, in tandem. So it means it's the same A as over here. They have the same A. And I'm going to do something nice here. So what I, what I have... What I now have are two equations and two unknowns. What I mean asked for is the acceleration A. So I have two equations. I have two unknowns. The unknowns are T and A. Those are my two unknowns. <clears throat> so what do you do with two equations, two unknowns? Well, you solve both equations for the, for the variable that you want to eliminate. You eliminate that variable. And then you solve for the variable that you want, in this case, A. So I'm going to solve both equations. So I got my A equation. So my A equation, I'm going to just rewrite it. So my A equation, I'm going to solve for T. T is going to be, I'm just going to throw M sub A, M sub A, G on the inner side. So it's just going to be uh, M sub A, G, or I'm sorry, M, yeah, M sub A, G plus M sub A, A. All right, two equations, two unknowns, and I'm going to eliminate T. <clears throat> so I can just set them equal to each other, right? And so what that says is that T equals, okay? So T is equal to 
negative m sub b a minus mu sub s m sub b g uh, cosine of theta plus m sub b g sine of theta, and it's also equal to m sub a g plus m sub a a. <clears throat> All right, so now I've now eliminated T. That's my new equation. All right, and so what I'm going to now do is I'm going to kind of throw everything on one side. So I'll throw anything that has A's in it on one side. So negative M sub A, A. I'm throwing that to the other side. Minus M sub B, A. Okay, All anything dealing with A's, which I'm trying to solve for, I'm going to throw on the left. And on the right, I'm going to throw, I'm going to put everything that doesn't have A on the right. What's that going to be? Well, it's going to be, um, <clears throat> um, let's see, uh, I'm going to throw this, the mu sub s term on the other side, goes from negative to positive. So mu sub s, m sub b, g, cosine of theta. And I'm going to throw this term on the other side. It becomes negative minus m sub b, g, sine of theta. And that should be everything. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply through by negative 1 and factor out A. So multiplying through by negative 1, factoring out A, I'll get A times the quantity M sub A plus M sub B over here. And again, I've multiplied through by negative 1, which means I've changed sign on the, on the terms on the right. So it's M sub B G sine of theta minus mu sub s m sub b g cosine of theta. <clears throat> okay? And so, um, and I can actually pull out a g common here, and I can divide through by m sub a plus m sub b. And so I'm going to do that. <clears throat> so I'm going to just uh, erase, erase the stuff up here now. I don't need it anymore. <clears throat> I'm doing a Real estate conservation here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna basically pull out a g and divide by the the sum m sub a plus m sub b. I'm just doing algebra now. A is now going to equal g times. I'm gonna, I'll put brackets here. I pull the g out. I have m sub b sine of theta uh, minus mu sub s m sub b. Uh, cosine of theta. Okay. And all divided by the sum m sub a <coughs> plus m sub b. All right. There you go. And so that's the final equation that you want. And it's now time to plug in some values. Now, again, I what I don't know, I don't know M sub A and M sub B because I have these goofy, goofy units, right? And so what I got to do is I have to kind of fix a few things up before I can actually do, do this equation. So I'm going to erase this stuff down here. That is the equation. That's my final equation. The thing is I don't have any real numbers yet. So remember what I said when I started coming in here. I said block B weighed 100 pounds, right? So that means that M sub B G was 100 pounds. And if you go to your, you know, to your uh, unit conversions, you realize that there are 4.448 Newtons in a pound. So again, I'm not very good at using English units. So some people are better than me. Some people could probably just do this in a, in, a, in an English unit, uh, in English units, I, I tend to like go to SI, so there's less chance of me messing things up, and I'll convert to I'll go I'll convert back to English at the end. So I'm going to convert to newtons. So m sub b g, <clears throat> when I work this out, is is simply going to be 444.8 newtons. All right, which means that m sub b will be 448. Um, sorry, 444.8 newtons divided by 9.80 meters per second squared 
I'm dividing by G. And so M sub B, I would find doing this is 45.4 kilograms. All right, so let me put that off to the side. M sub B is 45.4 kilograms. Okay. I need that because I have M's by themselves, right? So there you go, and I'll convert to English at the end. Um, now I got to convert the M's. I got to convert the M sub A. So same math as before. M sub A G we're told is 32 pounds. Well, that's going to be 4.448 newtons per pound. M sub A G will be. Uh, 142.3 newtons. Using the same math, I would say that M sub A, I'm going to divide both sides by G, is 142.3 newtons divided by 9.80 meters per second squared. M sub A, I will find is 14.5 kilograms. All right, put that over on the side. Okay, um, now I have what I need to solve this. And so now it's just a matter of uh, putting it all in. A is, let's see, got to write a little, I need, I need real estate here. A is the G is 9.80 meters per second squared. Times brackets. Okay, M sub B, I figured that one out. It's 45.4 kilograms. Sine of 45 degrees. Uh, minus mu, so minus mu sub S, sorry about this. Uh, mu sub S, I'm sorry, mu sub, oops. Yeah, yeah mu sub S, I apologize. Mu sub S, we were told in this problem coming in, it's 0 0.56. Yes, 0 0.56 was the coefficient of static friction times, again, 45.4 kilograms times the cosine of 45 degrees. And that bracket, all of this, is divided by M sub A plus M sub B. So again, that's going to be 14.5 uh, kilograms plus 45.4 kilograms. I find that the acceleration in this particular case is going to be uh, negative 6.26 times 10 to the negative three, a minuscule acceleration, meters per second squared, definitely within the, um, and if I were to put, even convert this back into feet per second squared, it'd be negative 6.26 times 10 to the negative three meters per second squared. Um, there are 3.281 feet in a meter. And I'd find some minuscule value of negative 2.05 times 10 to the negative 2 feet per second squared. And really within the confines of this problem, to present this problem, what I've really just determined is the acceleration is zero. So in this particular case, when it's starting at um, static, static uh, when it's starting stationary, the acceleration really the initial the initial acceleration is zero feet per second squared. Because I don't